thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I, I thought I'd just begin with two things. First of all, just to say that in the past few years I've been working extensively on uh, issues of human relationships, particularly on uh, gender inequalities and gender equalities in the region, working specifically with uh, churches and faith-based organizations, and now reaching out, uh, partnering with human rights agencies like uh, um, Secretary of Pacific Community, um, Regional Resource Rights Center, and that, so the work is extending toward them as well. Um, and also working on ending violence against women, uh, girls and children, particularly from the perspective of the faith traditions. That's, where, uh, so the, that's what I've been doing in the past few years. And uh, in my new role, that's, I'll continue to focus on that plus other focus areas as well. Um, so, in presenting this side, I just want to start with the current status. And when I talk about religion, I'm basically talking about Christianity because that's uh, my uh, where I belong, and um, I've been working within that for uh, well since I was small, growing up in that religion. Um, and if, if we look around the region, the very obvious facts. So let me begin with the very obvious facts, and then I'll go back a little bit into history and come back to the present again. Um, first of all. When we look at all the churches within the Pacific region, all of them, without exception, have a male head. There is no female as head of the church. Okay? Most of the decision-making bodies of the churches are dominated by men. Now we're beginning to see some positive changes. We're in beginning to see women participating in uh, decision-making uh, bodies of the, of the churches. And so that's the reality. In some cases, there are now changes. We have churches now who uh, allow women to become clergy, to become ordained in, in church. At the moment, Kiribati, Kiribati United Church is the leading church in the region where, where the male, female um, ministers almost are 50-50%. The difference is that it seems to be that the church is a setting where women uh, clergy can actually come up because when they go back to the wider society, another kind of relationship takes over, which is that the only manner, which is the male leadership, the male headship in culture. Uh, then we have the other extreme way it has been legalized that women cannot enter the ordained ministry, the uh, Methodist Church in Samoa, for example. Um, is, uh, has passed it in the Constitution that uh, for the time being, only men can, can be, uh, enter the, uh, the ordained ministry. And then we have several churches where, um, in the Pacific, where increasingly a number of women are coming into the church. So that's the current situation that we have at the moment. So church, predominantly male in the region, leadership, predominantly male at the top. When you come to the middle and the lower end, you have the activity of women much more than the men. Okay, and this is across the region, that women are amongst the most active members and participants in, in, in the church. But at the top leadership, they are not there. So what, uh, how can we explain this male dominance uh, within the uh, Christianity, Christian churches in the region? And this is where I'll go back a little bit into history. Uh, history is always important, as we have heard from the beginning. In this particular case, I'm going to look at the macro-historical forces, particularly with the Western Christian traditions and the kind of uh, masculinities that were um, uh, ex uh, highlighted or stressed during the history of Christianity. And for some reason, for good or bad, um, much of these conceptualizations of masculinity in the Christian history seem to go back uh, to the ideas of Aristotle about men and women. Um, so let me just give a very brief uh, historical snapshot of, uh, of this history. And because this history of uh, conceptualization of masculinity within, the, within Christianity in the region um, goes back to a 
lot of the conceptualizations that were deeply embedded in, in the history of Christianity itself. Um, just to say here that Aristotle uh, said that man by nature is superior and a fully developed human being, opposed to the woman. Man has strong ability to reason, power of the mind. Um, man plays a more active role in the, con in the appropriation conception of human life. Man is the natural ruler. Okay, all of these ideas go back. And these thoughts of Aristotle regarding men and women actually were adapted and Christianized by the early church fathers and successive theologians through the Christian history. One of the very well-known um, apologists in the very early uh, uh, periods, for example, the Italians say that only man, not woman, is the image of God. Um, Saint Augustine, bless his soul, uh, one of the most well-known <laughs> patriarchs um, of uh, Christianity, also had uh, some issues, some images of women that were not very good. Only man is the normative image of God, uh, he said. That in the natural order of relationships, men rule over women. Um, even uh, coming to the Middle Ages, Thomas Aquinas, uh, well-known uh, theologian, much more known also for his neo-Aristotelian philosophies, mixed with theology. Uh, saying that the man is the active principle in procreation and this active principle was in, is inherited from the male partner and from um, divine beings. Um, Martin Luther, the, one of the great so-called reformers in Christianity, uh, insisted that man is superior to woman and this is actually what he said and I quote him, I'm quoting from him. The rule remains with the husband. The wife is compelled to obey him by God's command. He rules the home, the state wages wars, defends his possessions, including his wife, tills the soil, builds, plants. The woman is like a nail driven into the wall." Unquote. And this is from, from one of the great uh, reformers in Christianity. And uh, finally, last but not least, also one of the most influential and respected theologians in the Protestant tradition, Karl Barth, even as he died, uh, he passed away in 1986. Um, and uh, he argued that the social order which God had ordained from the beginning was the rule of some men, husbands, uh, masters, and the subjugation of others, women, wives, slaves. And but justified this view as reflecting the covenant of creation, namely the rule of men over women. Um, fortunately, also he changed a lot of this towards his death. And so some of what he said earlier on. Um, so the very uh, dominant kind of Christian con conceptualization of masculinity uh, in the Pacific um, follows very, very closely to what was said throughout the history of Christianity. So let me just summarize this. And I, uh, I know this because I've been working with many churches throughout the region over the past five to six years. First of all, that man is the image of God, woman is a reflection of the man. Man is the first in the order of creation, woman is a helper, a kind of an assistant. Man is the stronger and woman the weaker sex, the weaker gender. In the family, husband is the head and leader of the wife and the family. Man has the responsibility to provide for and to protect the family and so on. And uh, like uh, Penny has said, a lot of these are present in, not just in Samoa, but throughout the churches across uh, across the Pacific. Um, these are, as some research, researchers have shown, these are now entangled with uh, uh, macro forces, big forces, but, uh, particularly economic forces, financial forces, um, and therefore they play out differently in different ways now because of the influences uh, that are uh, happening. Um, in my work, unfortunately, some of these uh, conceptions of masculinity, which predominate all the churches, they have contributed to, uh, to violence against women and girls. Um, 
in the Pacific, uh, the, more than, except Fiji, more than 90% of the population of every country is Christian. And if we look at the violence against women and girls statistics, it ranges from about 40 to 70 percent. Just by a very casual glance at the statistics, we can almost say, some can almost say that, okay, if that's the case, then perhaps a lot of the violence is happening in the churches. And uh, um, this, uh, one of the reasons of that would be because the conceptualization of masculinity that is predominant in the churches are what I have uh, gone through. Um, in the work that I've been doing, I have actually come across many instances where the Bible, especially the priority given to the man, to the husband, is used as justification for violence. So used uh, to support the sole headship and leadership of the man in, in the families. Um, so, religion, Christianity, is a very major force in not only conceptualizing, but also in enabling the outworkings of a particular um, conceptualization of being man within the Christian uh, churches in the Pacific. Um, in the past few years also, we have started to see changes that are happening. When some churches here in Fiji, for example, they are taking active stand uh, to work against this issue of violence. And uh, just to end, I'd, I'd, I'd like to tell two very short stories, both uh, in Vanuatu. A few years ago, me and my wife, we worked together because we not, don't want to just talk about partnership or equal, we want model model. So my wife and I did a one week workshop for the church leaders and community leaders in Vanuatu. And we invited, we, we opened the invitation to couples, husband and wives, so that they can also come. And so husbands and wives came, and we put them together. Uh, and during the week, we talked about relationship between husbands and wives, men and women, the dignity of both, the equality of both. There is no room for violence. There is no room to belittle anybody from a biblical theological perspective. And not, one of the church leaders was sitting there. He was one of those who, who came with his wife. And uh, on Thursday during the week, um, the wife came just to tell a story. And, and she said, I'm so happy. I need to tell this. I need to you know, get this off my chest. We've been married for more than 30 years. And for uh, the past 20 years or so in the ministry, my husband has not done anything apart from waiting for the food and uh, going to church and preaching. For the first time in more than two years of marriage, this morning I was still asleep. He came and woke me up and said, uh, can you please come, come. The wife said, what's happening? Just come, please. And then for the first time, my husband brought me to the kitchen you know, and then prepared all the food. And the husband said to her, I've seen the light. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I wish I can just bring back those 20 years. Here is your food. From now on, I'll be a change. I'll, I'll do things differently. Yeah, and we've, we've seen those stories. And finally, also from Vanuatu, in the most recent one that I did, um, and this is where culture and religion, culture and Christianity you know, marry and become a very strong force in a particular conceptualization of masculinity that is understood in the church. During the, during the talk, by the way, I got this as a gift from Vanuatu several years back. I thought it was so beautiful, you know, it's beautiful and it's still beautiful, until just very recently when one of the participants in the workshop stood up to make a comment. And then he said, you know, the problem for us in Vanuatu now, and then he drew a, a picture, the problem for us in Vanuatu now is this. In culture, and I'm sorry, you can't see that, but in culture he said, it should be like this. The man stands up and the wife sits down. Okay, now the wife wants to stand up together with the husband and therefore we have many problems. 
And suddenly I remember this because this is the this is the painting of that symbol. If you see from there, the the, the picture of a person and the man is standing up, the wife should be leveled. And then he said, that's the problem. And this kind of uh, cultural thinking uh, is also still prevalent in the church and you know, together with the very strong sense of Christian masculinity, leader, head, provider, uh, all of that, it uh, um, leads to many, many other problems. So I will stop there in a long time. In your recounting of the Western theological tradition, uh, give a feminist critique of many of the patriarchs of faith. But you haven't given the other side of the story, and that's the Western feminist theological tradition, which has been around for uh, over a hundred years. Why hasn't that tradition penetrated into the Pacific? I mean, it's, it's, barely, it's barely there. And what is it about the culture, the Christianity in the Pacific, which continues to reinforce this patriarchal uh, tradition, despite the best efforts of yourself and myself and others? Um, I think one of the reasons I would say is that when, when the missionary uh, uh, activities came into our shores, the focus then was not on you know, whether masculinity or feminine. The focus at that time was purely on saving souls, on bringing pagan, pagans from darkness in, into light. Uh, so there was not a lot of emphasis on what uh, you know, some of us are doing at the, at the moment. That for me is one of the one of the reasons. Uh, it was just not the emphasis. It was not the primary focus of missionary endeavors to do that. Um, it was only very recently that we begin. Uh, the other reason, in my opinion, um, is that, as you would also know, that uh, the um, feminist theology came uh, very much into the fore from the mid 20th century, and so yeah, seven years or so. Uh, what has not, um, um, well, let, let, let me put it uh, uh, differently. One of the, the cultural, uh, you know, the strength of the cultural per perceptions within the region, many of them were still very, uh, patriarchal in nature. Although in some places we have, uh, we used to have and still have what they call uh, matrilineal descent, in effect where those still are existing, it is still the men who make the decisions. Um, I know this because I come from a matrilineal society, but it's the men who actually make a lot of the, of the decisions. But I think the biggest reason why that has not happened is because um, there is no, uh, at the leadership level, uh, there is no really challenge, there is no really steps taken at the leadership level to challenge the existing dominant uh, you know, theologies and the domin do uh, dominant uh, masculine uh, uh, conceptions of men. There is not really that push, very strong push there is a lot of comfortability in the way things are at the moment. And I think nobody is really willing to shake or rock, rock the boat. Um, uh, yeah, so there are various factors, but I just want to find out those. I think we, we, we fail to understand, or we, we, rather, we, we fail to appreciate uh, something critical. Uh, which has to do with the form of religion being practiced as uh, perhaps an imposed form of practice in, in terms of beliefs and uh, whatever practices are uh, inherent in that. And in as much as uh, there has been a push towards uh, feminist theology, so to speak, in this part of the world, uh, I think this. We share quite a lot with, uh, with Africa, 
uh, in the sense that so many things that are being pushed uh, in the church, uh, the church I mean the generic uh, Christian uh, church, there is a lot of hesitation and resistance. Um, we tend to quote uh, those uh, things that we've been quoting and trying to justify why things need to remain the way they are. And I remember, and it's not just on, on, on uh, men versus women, the benefits, it's sometimes on issues of sexuality. Uh, the American church, for instance, is uh, about for certain congregations in Africa about to split from the mother church, quote unquote, on issues of ordaining uh, gay priests. But it, and I'm, I'm sure you we all appreciate that. What was framed in the name of religion or, or, or Christianity was inherently uh, bias against uh, equality of sexes and all these other things. I mean, all these things we say. And it's, these things are not going to change in uh, one generation. And the institution itself thrives on perhaps purveying uh, those particular ideas in every way. And it's, it's not just Christianity, it's many institutionalized religions, and that is what they, they propagate. And sometimes uh, it leaves some of us questioning what this God is who would want to create people and then also perpetuate and perpetuate all these particular relations and some of them quite horrible, so to speak. Yeah, it's just a point. Um, so I can comment, um, it's sort of a question as a follow-up to the discussion around why haven't, um, like say for instance, why haven't we adopted a feminist perspective of Christianity, uh, whereas we've adopted so many other elements um, from outside. I, one of the things that I've noticed in the Pacific, um, in Fiji, and also um, in Vanuatu and some other Malaysian countries, that there are certain elements not only of Christianity but also of Hinduism and Islam in Fiji. There are certain elements that have progressed but a lot more have not. It has regressed or become more fundamentalized. And uh, that's something um, you know that uh, intrigues a lot of us. Like, uh, for instance, uh, in Hindus, Hinduism, like you see in India, there has been a lot of progression where you have a lot of um, female priests, for instance. In Fiji, we do not at all. Um, so, so these are some of the questions, um, you know, when we talk about it, like, um, within our circles, we, and some of the things that we think about, is it because of our colonial history? Um, and not only with Hinduism, like all the religions, is it because of the high prevalence of violence against women that this is? Is, it, is, it, is that why women are not becoming so actively involved and participating in the religious discourse? Um, and also as young um, evolving democracies, um, there's so much political instability, uh, militarization, so how does this all affect how we evolve in terms of um, religion and women's participation um, in religion? So just some of the things that I think um, we should be conscious of as we are discussing um, religion and women's role in religion. Yeah, thank you. From a, a historical perspective, when, when the missionaries uh, came, a lot of the, the contacts was with men. And in, in fact, uh, the elevation of the leadership of men was uh, in the, in, I'm talking now especially about Christianity, the elevation of men as leaders was part and parcel of the missionary project. And uh, therefore, that from the very beginning, men were you know, appointed leaders and they ran the uh, the, and, and, and all of that. Um, so that that's part of the of the uh, of the problem. Secondly, uh, for Christianity in particular, um, the Bible is for most mo of the people who go to church in the Pacific the almost like the number one the number one book, in particular interpretations of that. I remember in, in, in La Foca when um, doing workshop with the uh, Anglican Church, one of the pastors said to me, you know, the Bible says the wife is the weaker partner and therefore needs the protection of the husband, needs the protection of the man. Um, and so, um, 
we are still very much thinking along those lines and there is not enough of us who are thinking outside of it and trying to critique and rethink all that kind of very dominant kind of understanding of the sacred texts uh, for example there's very few uh, who are doing that uh, at the moment um, it's also interesting to note that the, the biggest uh, uh, Muslim group in Indonesia just uh, some time back they put out a uh, you know um, an announcement at the meeting of the youth and, and calling for a re reading a re reinterpretation of the, of the sacred texts uh, also and that's what we need to happen take place within the church in the Pacific and uh, in uh, uh, small little ways that's beginning to take place but a lot really needs to happen um, in order to transform the patriarchy the male leadership uh, of the Christianity in the Pacific but also in breaking through the very strong traditional biblical interpretations surrounding uh, particular conception of masculinity in the churches.